Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> this is Melanie, uh, one of the co-hosts of Red Power Hour. Uh, I'm joining here, as I did two weeks ago, from Minishota Makoche, otherwise known as the Twin Cities, my new home, um, a guest on Dakota Homelands here. And yeah, we're going to talk about uh, what's happening in the world. We're going to do kind of a news roundtable, a uh, news roundup. We haven't done this in like months, <laughs> months on Red Power Hour. We're usually uh, talking trash about pop, pop culture, which, you know, like everyone loves anyway. And I love doing that. But we just felt like there was so much happening um, in the last two or three weeks that we kind of needed to provide you know, like the indigenous left analysis that the Red Nation podcast offers for some things that are happening um, and do it from, you know, the the Red Power Hour style, the Native Woman Freestyle that we're, we're known for here. But uh, I want my um, my co-host, Elena, to introduce yourself and then also Jen, who's joining us. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, y'all. Hello, this is Elena Ortiz calling in from Ogapoge, otherwise known as Santa Fe. Grateful to be here with these fabulous women and Get ready for some wild action. Thank you, TEV comrades. Uh, my name is Jen Marley. I'm calling in from uh, Pescataway land and Anacostia land, um, AKA the Dark Citadel, Washington, DC. Um, and well, technically I'm in Maryland right now, which is cool. Um, but yeah, um, I'm out here and I'm happy to be joining this round table because there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot we've been talking about behind the scenes within Red Nation. And I'm glad we're going to get to get you in on some of these conversations. Sweet. Thanks for joining us from the Death Star. <laughs> I was thinking the Death Star was another at a, um, apropos <laughs> neighborhood calling in from. Uh, yeah. I mean, who? where do we begin? I, um, I created a, a massive... Uh, notes for the episode just because I didn't know what to concentrate on. But I think what we're going to try to concentrate on today are a few different topics. Um, We want to talk about what's being increasingly framed as the cost of living crisis that's happening in the global south and the global north, Um, how that's affecting us personally, the things we've been seeing, but also what this means um, politically, but also kind of materially for everyone, including indigenous people here in the coming months of 2022. Uh, most economic predictions is that it's going to get worse, actually. Uh, and then we're going to talk about <laughs> what I called in the notes SCOTUS trash. Um, so the recent slew of uh, Supreme Court decisions in the United States, but also upcoming Supreme Court decisions um, that have basically implied that the federal government, the United States, is declaring war um, again on Native sovereignty and Native women and children um, and what that means and why we need to actually be paying attention and have a strong analysis uh, as indigenous people, but also the, our leaders, right, of our indigenous nations here um, in the United States, and why we really need to be paying attention to this as like a very serious attack on tribal sovereignty and on the the modern nationhood movement, um, right? That that created the department that I teach in American Indian Studies. Is the only reason why that department came into existence in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, And then we're going to do a little bit about um, Comrade Bison, you know, the things that have been happening in Yellowstone. Elena, I'm going to let you take that over. And then we haven't done this in a long time. Um, It's probably controversial, probably doesn't rub people the right way all the time, but a glad you're dead (laughs) section. Um, There's a major glad you're dead moment that happened this week in Mexico. So I'll do that. I'm happy (laughs) in the spirit that I usually do. And any other stories y'all want to talk about? Um, There's a historic land return for the Onondaga Nation that also happened this week that I think is a really beautiful kind of bright light in what is otherwise um, kind of a nightmarish present, actually. So do you want me to get us started off on the cost of living crisis stuff? Okay, so everyone I'm assuming who's listening has like obviously noticed the increase in gas prices, right? It's five to seven dollars right now, pretty much everywhere in the United States. Um, I myself went to the grocery store here in the Twin Cities about 10 days ago. I had not gotten groceries in quite some time, maybe like the two weeks, maybe like two weeks. And I noticed that there was a massive increase in pretty much every commodity on the shelf in the grocery store. So much so that I actually was having to make difficult choices between purchasing things that I would normally buy to eat 
And I'm talking like basic things like proteins, like basic proteins, like fresh fruits and vegetables kind of thing. Um, and was facing kind of like a new reality of like a very limited, uh, like a limited number of things that I could buy that were still healthy and nutritious. Um, and really like decreasing the amount of snack foods that I was buying, for example, because like Cheetos. <laughs> I mean, I know that like giving up Cheetos isn't necessarily considered, you know, like a travesty. But for Native people, it really is. <laughs> like Cheetos are a staple of our diet. And Cheetos were like $5 a bag. And I was like, fuck, I'm not spending $5 a bag on Cheetos. Like I'll just have to forego this, um, this delicious snack that I usually eat. But what I'm trying to say is that there's Inflation, right? Inflation is a serious problem. Um, it's rising in all over the world in both global south and global north countries. And there is something that's being coined is called the cost of living crisis. I'm seeing it emerge in the news over the last week or two to describe, you know, what is happening and what everyday people are experiencing all over the world, right? Which is the increase in the cost of living, the increase in particularly food, housing, and fuel prices. You know, the things that we need in order to just kind of survive and to have a quality of life on an everyday basis. And it's actually getting so bad. And it's, again, I said, like, the prediction is that it's going to get worse throughout 2022, that it's reaching now into the middle class in global North countries, um, where people are really being forced to decide, having to make hard choices between making rent um, and eating three meals a day. And Jen told me that actually you should describe this, Jen, that you read a story about this, that like, like medieval, like medieval kind of like diseases related to poor quality of food or like unsanitary conditions or lack of access to food, things like botulism and scurvy are also on the rise right now, even in global North countries, um, because of the increasing amount of food insecurity and the increasing amount of precarity that is now crossing class boundaries, um, you know, all over the world. And of course, like uh, our relatives in the global South are obviously facing, they're really on the front lines of this. They're facing the brunt of um, the massive like uh, shortage in food supply. That's partly causing, that's what people are saying that's causing inflation and causing um, food insecurity. But then there's also, um, as people I'm sure noticed during the pandemic, the massive shortage of workers. Um, I don't know if you noticed the service industry in the United States. People were literally just like not coming to jobs and people were refusing to work under the conditions of the pandemic. Um, and so you like couldn't even get sometimes like food at McDonald's and things like that. Things that are considered typically like poor people food, actually, like the kind of food that you can have access to when you have a very limited income um, and so there's a, a supply chain issue with the food itself and the production, but then also with the workers who are serving the food and probably like producing the food that's then turned into commodities that you find on the shelf in grocery stores. And that this is actually climate change, the pandemic, and most people are blaming the war in Ukraine actually is another kind of cause of this. I mean, arguably U.S. imperialism and capitalism are really the causes of this and like the hoarding of wealth and resources by the global ruling class is actually the culprit for everything that's happening. But all of us are feeling this. I think the effects of this, um, I know that several families that I know in Albuquerque, um, families who have lived and been able to rent, um, you know, just basic, like basic ass one bedroom apartments in a, a typical apartment complex in Albuquerque within the last two to three months have been completely priced out of the entire rental market in Albuquerque and are having to move back in with family on the reservation. Most of these are Navajo families and Navajo people who have stable jobs. And so now this is affecting, obviously, of course, like the housing crisis that Native people continue to face, where we have five to 15 people living in one house, you know, in a place called like the Navajo Nation. Um, and so exacerbating that housing crisis. So uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit about this to kind of have an honest conversation about the reality that people are facing, um, trying to think about why this is happening. And I'm not really entirely sure I know what to do about it, but I think actually just naming it and being in solidarity with um, the struggle, the real struggle that increasing nu numbers of people in the world are facing. Um, that's just something we wanted to talk about today. So Jenna, Elena, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I'll expand a little bit on what I was talking about. So I had read an article um, recently about uh, food quality standards decreasing. So I think the, what I was reading was from out of Germany um, but basically there's um, 
new food related diseases, foodborne illnesses that are popping up um, that were thought to be not so common because um, now in order to meet demand and to cheaply uh, produce food goods, um, they're basically cutting corners. And I don't think they have like necessarily like an entity like the FDA there that oversees it. So it's a little easier for that to happen. Um, so there's now like outbreaks of things like botulism and like Melanie had mentioned scurvy because people can't afford fresh fruit, fresh citrus. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if such things are happening here in the United States, whether it be canned goods or even fast food goods. Um, my sister yesterday was like, oh, they have like 40 chicken nuggets at McDonald's for $12.99. And I'm like, in this economy, they put the beaks back in, like probably... <laughs> <laughs> I yeah I'm concerned about um not only the decrease in food uh production and the way we literally see empty shelves at grocery stores I know I do here um in DC I spent like almost two hundred dollars for like a week's worth of food for just myself I'm having to personally skip meals um <laughs> I think a lot of people are and this so obviously this is impacting people um you know across across class boundaries which you know are, are ever obscure right um right now uh the i mean just the wealth wealth inequality is so 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 brazen like these contradictions are just so so clear right now it's, it's worse so than at any point in history wealth inequality <gasps> in 2022 is the worst it's ever been yeah truly uh and i think um it is important to just simply say that and name that. And I, I hope people acknowledge that, um, you know, this kind of suffering cannot be blamed on like one's individual, like value as a worker, or one's like personal output for work. This is, this will come for you, right? If it hasn't already, which is probably very unlikely unless you're super rich. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm, not only am I concerned about the lack of access to food, I'm also concerned about the quality of food and the decreasing quality in food and the the um, accompanying um, illness that is, we're probably going to see more of here in the near future. And then that will lead to um, more labor shortages and um, higher price. I mean, everything is connected. And when you all were talking about, well, Melanie, when you were talking about the Supreme Court trash, SCOTUS trash, um, you know, the other and linking the inflation and um, food um, supply crisis to climate change, SCOTUS also um, ruled that the United States government doesn't have the authority to um, monitor or not to monitor, but to moderate greenhouse gases. Um and so basically coal fired generating plants can exist and the U.S. government, um, who everybody thought once Joe Biden was elected, that that was going to be one of the first things that he did was address and hopefully mitigate climate change. Well, the Supreme Court um, has has basically. Well, he wasn't going to do it anyway, let's face it. Um, but the Supreme Court bound his hands on that. So, so that is contributing to um, more climate change, which will contribute to having less um, arable land for food production and um, increased uh, food uh, costs for the people that can least afford them. And like you said, they're, you know, if you're a millionaire, this is not going to impact you. But this is all connected because if families can't feed their their children, um, then uh, children are going without food. There's going to be um, health impacts, which most of these people, if they can't afford food, they can't afford medical insurance either. So that's going to impact um, the already limited resources that many people face living in rural areas like the reservation and the Indian Health Service, which isn't the best that's like the understatement of the decade um in the world but all of this is is connected and all of this will will serve to impact communities that can least afford to absorb that impact 
And our leaders, which we'll talk more about later, aren't doing anything about it. Yeah, the speaking of leaders, um, you know, there, I don't know if folks have been paying attention, but there have been like massive protests in many places in the world against leaders. Um, presidents, for example, of various countries that are experiencing like really, uh, how not to use ableist language, uh, inflation that is destroying people's economic stability and health, um, like widespread numbers of people that uh, people are storming like presidents' houses. Um, they're staging massive protests. The UK, I believe in Argentina. Um, there's like varying reports about the the thing that went down in Sri Lanka a couple of days ago, but um, that is also seeming seems to be connected to the high rates of inflation also in Sri Lanka. And so there are massive protests that are causing for, calling for the removal of uh, presidents from nations. I mean, I know that there's a growing movement in the United States that is like heavily blaming Biden um, for the cost of gas and his incompetence in lowering the cost of gas. Uh, most of these are right wing efforts, I think, to demonize him in the lead up to um, the 2022 elections um, and just kind of a general assault on the Democratic Party in general. But a lot of folks are placing blame on governments, um, national and federal governments for the crisis, right, for the the kind of the widespread suffering that people are experiencing. Now, I'm I. I question that. I understand um, blaming those in power for not doing anything about inflation. But the thing is, is like what, like what you said, Elena, what are these leaders going to do to curb inflation? I mean, what Biden has already done is he's increased fossil fuel production, right? He's completely gone back on his promise to like uh, for a full moratorium on fracking. And the right is really has really pressured him. Um, to open up fracking again, to kind of like to quote unquote reduce, right? To reduce the the inflation um, and the cost of gas. I don't really know what the numbers are right now for the increase. Is there like an increase in natural gas and just like energy, like electric, like your electric bill? Has your electric bill gone up for your house, right? So just like energy, the cost of energy in relationship to like household kind of functioning, but then also transportation, I think has gone up. And so- putting blame on national governments for like not providing relief to everyday people. Unfortunately, it comes in the form of those governments being like, well, okay, so we're going to have to open up these oil fields again. We're going to have to open up these fracking fields to increase production um, to meet the the demand of, of consumers who are really struggling at the gas pump. And so it's like, okay, so we're going to put like climate justice and like curbing climate change. Cause we're already on like a, like a death course <laughs> towards total destruction with climate change. So we're just going to like put that aside um, to try to just help people like survive in the, you know, in the short term. And so that is also like a totally suicidal kind of approach to addressing inflation. And so I've just been trying to think about like, what do we actually do? What do we actually do besides mutual aid, right? Besides supporting people right now, those of us who have some resources available to support people who are really in need, who are like, I think it's something like um, the Blair Institute, which I'm, I'm not really sure why I'm quoting them because I think it's like Tony Blair's Research Institute and he's like a centrist POS, right? But I think I said recently, a report came out recently that like 55 million people throughout the world are on the brink of total famine. They're like one meal away from famine. And so there's a real need right now. Um, and we saw mutual aid networks arise really beautifully um, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic two and a half years ago. Um, I'm assuming mutual aid is going to have to be a major kind of stopgap um, in, in the current conditions to try to help people afford to keep homes, roofs over their head, um, to have people have food and just like basic kind of needs met. But like, what are we going to be doing structurally and politically to really address this in a way that doesn't put climate justice on the chopping block, which which is a tie to like indigenous futures. You can't put indigenous futures on the chopping block to save people because indigenous futures are actually going to save people. <laughs> like That's what's going to save people. And so you can't like, you know, you can't compromise that mobilization and that movement um, just to provide like basic necessities for people. And so what is the solution? And like, I, I don't see the United States is just like, like, let's go to war with Russia. <laughs> like, 
let's like ice out China. Like the U.S.'s response is basically to be like, nope, we're just going to double down on U.S. imperialism. We're going to continue to dominate the world. We're not actually going to provide any real services to like working class or like poor people in the United States. Kind of what the U.S. did during the pandemic, like nothing except increase military budgets. I think the U.S. provided 40 percent of all the funding to NATO's hypermilitarization that also happened this week. And so it's like, wait, seriously, your answer to this is to more war and like more militarism like that obviously can't be the answer either. So anyway, well, like quite literally, like that is their answer. And um, historically, we know that that's been the case. That, you know, World War II is the famous example that's always cited. Um but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I got some stats from this article that came out from the Progressive International recently, and it says that for the first time in history, the world spent over $2 trillion on weapons in 2021, U.S. accounting for 40% of that in total, and now NATO has committed to increasing its rapid response force nearly eightfold. And so um, this hypermilitarization is in fact the response to massive famine and inflation all over the world. And we know that weapons can't fill up empty stomachs. They can't repair a dying planet. Um, and, you know, not only is this an effort to, um, you know, I, to retain wealth, perhaps, it's also about geopolitics, right? It's about creating a geopolitical stronghold Um, near and in places that the U.S. perceives as a threat to its capitalist imperialist project, right, e.g. Russia and China, places that have provided, uh, well, particularly, I'll say particularly China in this case, um, has moved people out of poverty in record time, right, Um, on a massive scale that hasn't really been seen in history. And um, regardless of what you feel about that, there are political and economic alternatives Um, to the crisis that U.S. imperialism and global capitalism has created. And so, of course, that's where the U.S. is directing its assaults right now, even as its own people are suffering and starving. um, You know, there's still the finger being pointed at places where there's actually plans in place to care for and feed people while the shelves remain empty here. So um, I think I think there's a lot to think about in in terms of war efforts and this ramping up for war happening right now. And we were talking in our pre-meeting, like essentially the solution to massive inflation and hunger is uh, more war. Yeah, that that kind of just, I mean, I, I know it's true and it's always been the go-to for the U.S., except now we all know the stakes are much higher. Like this amount of militarization and what is the number one polluter on the planet? The U.S. military. And so we're facing a, we're facing a global food crisis and the response is to um, create war which will in turn expedite the destruction of the planet, at which point we will have no food, no matter how, I mean, it doesn't matter how much it's going to cost. If we can't produce food, if we can't grow our food, then we won't have any food. So it's, it's a, it's just a cycle and it's, it's this vicious cycle that we can't seem to get out of because the, the so-called leaders of the so-called free world um, don't don't seem to be able to get their heads out of their asses long enough to see that that everything that they're doing right now is is furthering the destruction of the planet, and it's the only response is total and complete revolution, and that that that's that's the only thing that we can do. And I don't know if we want to go here, but in our, in our meeting just now, we also talked about the possibility of building a plurinational project, right? And this is like, this is a dream of ours, right? Dream we carry in our heart, like looking to the plurinationalism of our relatives in 
South America, those who have successfully truly fought neoliberalism and the capitalist stronghold from the U.S., people who have defended their sovereignty and who have um, such a love and, and tolerance and practice cooperation for each other with each other through their plurinationalism and um there there are solutions right there are strategies like there are ways of countering this and i think the u.s knows that and is afraid of that um i think there have been multiple times when um revolutionaries outside of the u.s but also here in the imperial core have truly frightened uh you know the u.s have truly um upset their power hold and so i remain hopeful and i actually think even as things become more precarious i think there's there's ways that um you know our present conditions could be bent in our favor truly yeah i wanted to uh read something that came i think maybe out of the same article from the progressive international that um was issued on june 30th so a little over a week ago that you read from jen where they say kind of at the end of that piece that, quote, lasting peace can only be won by a common security framework that does not allow for the domination of one country by another or one block over one another, but rather succeeds to demilitarize the planet, fight its poverty, and pool common resources to secure social and environmental justice. In standing against these existential priorities, NATO and the United States, led by the United States, has revealed a preference for domination over the imperative of our survival, end quote. And I think that really sums it up in terms of what we're confronting, um, right? Thinking about, when I think about mutual aid, I think about like the immediate kind of support that people need to survive. But when I'm thinking about like the the political question and like what confronts us um, on a strategic and a political level, I'm thinking at the level of plurinationalism. I'm thinking at the level of this quotation and what this means, right? Um, from from the Progressive International, like we need a completely different model that is anti-imperial. I mean, we say this ad nauseum in the Red Nation, right? But it's fundamentally anti-imperialist because imperialism is just at a really basic definition is about world domination. Like that's what imperialism is, and the United States has been like going forth with a world domination approach, the Monroe Doctrine, since World War II, right? That's been the U.S.'s answer to absolutely everything. And capitalism is a form of imperialism. And in fact, like the militarization, the $2 trillion, like this unprecedented amount of money that has gone into the militarization of the planet at a time when people in the U.S. just two years ago were talking about the abolition and the demilitarization of the police and the military in general, and so we've had this like great, like this pendulum swing all the way back in the other direction where it's like, yes, in order to secure U.S. financial supremacy throughout the world, i.e. the hegemony of ca U.S. capitalism, we're going to put the full weight of the military, like the coercive apparatus of U.S. imperialism behind this because countries like Russia and China that have robust economies, it's their economy, it's not their like standing military that the U.S. is worried about. It's their economic might. The fact that Russia was providing, you know, energy to much of Europe in the wake of um, the U.S., like with the recession of 2008 and 2009. And the U.S. is like, no, we want to have power. We want to have economic power. We want to be the economic juggernaut of the world again. We want to be the shining beacon on the hill, right? This like famous thing that came out of like the right after the post-World War II moment. And so the U.S. still has this like this notion and this aspiration of just like total world domination and is really willing to do whatever it takes, whether it's like soft power, whether it's like sanctions, whether it's like the militarization, whether it's like covert kind of CIA type operations, whether it's like an ideological war on like the new pink tide in Latin America, for example. And the U.S. is literally just like bringing the entire world to the brink of collapse, right, in the name of this like doctrine of, of world supremacy. And so if we really if we really want to like survive, right, if we really want to save the planet and if we want to save ourselves, we have to be thinking really seriously about like politically and how we're organizing as people based movements against U.S. imperialism, 
because it really is the number one enemy of the planet. There's a reason why the U.S. military is the number one polluter and one of the primary causes of uh, climate change, right? Um, carbon emission, carbon emission driven climate change in the world. And so how how do we find the strength, right, and the clarity to be able to organize um, these really robust anti-imperialist movements? Many of our comrades in the Global South are already doing this, I think, in really powerful, beautiful ways. And so how do we bring what they have already done in the foundation they've set here, you know, in the belly of the beast, um, to really push back against this so that we can save ourselves, right? So we, we can have a future and then so that Mother Earth can have a future, um, because ultimately it's about peace, right? It's about peace. It's about cooperation. It's not about domination. And isn't that always what native nations have always wanted? We just want, we just want like autonomy and we want the U S to stop interfering in our internal affairs as nations and to be recognized as a nation that has all of the, the rights, right. That are conferred with like what we understand, um, a nation to be, which is sovereignty and self-determination and independence and autonomy. And so what we experience as indigenous nations is how the rest of the world also experiences the United States government, just like, just like a disgusting colonizer. <laughs> and so how do we all engage, right, in this anti-imperial kind of struggle for decolonization? Because I think our future really depends on it. Do we want to move into our conversation about SCOTUS is trash? Because Mel, you said something that's really stuck with me um, a few days ago that, um, so January 6th, we saw what people were referring to as a attempted coup, right? Uh, this is by um, the alt-right. And, um, you know, there's, there's this kind of discontent. But then now what we've seen with SCOTUS, this series of, decisions that have taken place within the span of a week have happened in tandem with each other in such a way that has like really really like essentially taken us back to like you said like the 1950s right pre-civil rights concessions like pre-women's lib um pre-red power and i think okay just looking at um overturn of roe v wade castro versus hurt the decision and then the um uh, taking away power from the EPA to um, uh, put caps on uh, pollution. These are blatant. These you know, these are all connected, right? This is a war on the earth. This is a war on women. This is a war on Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. And so we had, you know, we actually we saw this as an emergency. This is open season on everyone, and the alt right knows it, and they're very emboldened, right? Um, and not just the alt right, as in you know these um, forces on the ground often manifest as vigilantes, but also within government, right? And so it's very intentional what the Supreme Court is doing, and um, it's taking us. It's I mean this this should be cause for panic, right? I don't believe mass panic is beneficial, but if you're not a little bit scared about what's happening right now, I don't know if you really understand what's happening right now, and especially I'm concerned about what our tribal leaders are thinking um, in response to um, Castro versus Herta, right? This sets the groundwork for total termination of tribes. And so if tribal leaders are truly concerned about sovereignty and who's attacking their sovereignty, it's the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has essentially said, you are up for termination. And I haven't seen a single tribal leader, I sure hope they're talking about it, but I haven't seen a single one mention it publicly. Yeah. So what we were just talking about in the quote unquote international arena, right? The U.S. who the U.S. making major moves and dropping lots of cash and resources to reinforce its supremacy in the world. They're also doing it domestically against everyone, including native nations. And so we are seeing an absolute windfall happening right now. And it's like you said, it's happened in like the last two weeks or the week or 10 days or something, it has been incredibly swift. And it's clearly the culmination of a lot of work and mobilization 
by the ruling class and by the right globally, but especially centered in the United States, to bring these things into fruition and to make them a reality. And I was thinking like, yes, the the, the assault on the Capitol, like, fuck the Capitol, but the assault on the Capitol right on January 6th of 2021, why, how many, many people fashioned that as kind of like a a coup, like, like it looked like a coup, like, you know, people carrying guns and stuff. What we've actually been seeing with um, the militarization of NATO and the moves the U.S. is making geopolitically in the international arena, and then the moves that the U.S. is making through SCOTUS here in the domestic landscape is another type of coup, even though maybe people don't see that as, as what is actually happening. I think it's serious reactionary backlash against the calls for defunding the police and demilitarizing the U.S. under the, the kind of the larger aegis of, of abolition from the uprising, the George Floyd uprising of two years ago. I think what we're seeing, the assault on tribal sovereignty is entirely consistent with the general kind of disrespect um, that the U.S. has for anyone's sovereignty or like nation, like rights of nationhood throughout the entire world, but certainly against plurinationalism, which is a vision of sovereignty that is a new vision of sovereignty and nationhood that has primarily been secured by indigenous populist movements in Latin America. You know, like the U.S. is very afraid, right? And is really working hard to dismantle the ruling class. And by the U.S., I mean like the ruling class and the right primarily, right? Um, like settler politicians and like the corporations, the multinational corporations that they're in the pockets of. And so there's a clear understanding of like that indigenous people are actually consolidating power, but not like a creepy imperialist. It's not like an imperialism meeting another imperialism. I hear a lot of people in the global North say that like settler kind of like libs and like anarchisty kind of people. And that's just bullshit. That's not what's happening. It's just indigenous people trying to provide an alternative to just being under the boot of U.S. imperialism all the time. And you know what? Indigenous people anywhere in the world have an absolute right to try to dream of a type of nationhood where everyone's needs are met and where we're not kill killing the planet. It's what the recent Colombian election called like the movement for life. Indigenous people have every right to be utilizing the resources at their disposal to form a nationhood based on a movement for life. And that has actually been happening here in Turtle Island as well. And the people in power know it and they're trying to crush it. <laughs> I think Standing Rock represented that kind of unifying the water is life mantra was really a culmination of that politics of life here in the Turtle Island or the, the global north context of the Western Hemisphere. And so we're seeing like this soft coup, this coup, like this paper tiger, it's like masked in a different way against, I would say, Black liberation and Indigenous liberation and the gains that we have made in the United States in particular over the last decade of struggle. And so people need to be paying the fuck attention <laughs> to this because it is a really big deal. And it's happened so quickly. It's hard to digest. But Native nationhood, sorry, I'm just riffing now because I'm in an American, I've been in Native American studies and American Indian studies, you know, since 2019 was the time I was hired in NAS at UNM. I specialize in the history of that field that came into emergence in the 50s and 60s in tandem with Red Power. And the reason why NAS or AIS and Red Power formed was because of termination, right? It was the termination era and like the, the way that the United States was trying to completely dismantle and disappear Native nations that created the context for the, the revolutionary struggle that, that characterized that period of indigenous liberation in, in that, that history here, at least in the United States. And we are facing a new termination era. Remember when Trump tried to terminate um, the Wampanoag, uh, Mashpee Wampanoag, was that what it was in Connecticut? Um, that was just like a, a precursor to what we're seeing here now um, with the follow-up to the McGirt decision. Um, and two main things, two main things that have always been fought by by uh, revolutionaries and by Native American studies scholars, two pillars of the field, as well as that history of fighting for Native nationhood against the tide of termination in the 50s and the 60s. And one of those is understanding that Native people are not a racial group in the United States, but that we are nations. And that having the status as a nation to nation relationship with the United States is one of the foundational pillars of federal Indian policy, first of all. And that was fought for and won by pe by activists, by strong tribal leaders in the 50s and the 60s. And right now, the Brocken versus Holland 
decision that SCOTUS is going to be overseeing, which is about the Indian Child Welfare Act, it was basically a group of white folks were saying that it, they were facing reverse discrimination because of their race, i.e. like um, the placement of Native children in Native families versus white families, which is what ICWA protects. It protects the placement of Native children in Native families. And so if that decision goes the way it's going to go, which is probably part of this reactionary backlash against Native nationhood, it's basically going to reinforce the idea that Native people are a racial group rather than nations. So that literally takes us back 70 years to where we were at at the beginning of Red Power. The second thing is state jurisdiction or state state rights or sovereignty over Native sovereignty, which relates back to Public Law 280 and the fight, the really intense struggle that Native nations and activists went through in the middle part of the 21st century, saying like, no, state state sovereignty and state jurisdiction does not have supremacy over Native sovereignty. We have a distinct political relationship with the United States government. We have a nation to nation relationship. We are separate from states and we absolutely should not be subjected to state sovereignty. We are separate from states. And the, the movements to get gaming on reservations in the latter part of the 1980s and the early 90s was also a pushback against kind of state jurisdiction over tribal affairs. And so the revision to the 2020 McGirt decision is basically saying, actually, yes, yeah, states have jurisdiction over, over tribal, um, tribal, over kind of a certain type of criminal, kind of criminal jurisdiction on tribal lands, which essentially is like reducing an entire case law precedent in federal Indian policy claiming that states actually do not have jurisdiction over tribal affairs. And it's a serious diminishment of tribal sovereignty and like this type, this this vision and this practice of nationhood, the nation to nation relationship that I think many of us have considered untouchable um, over the last 50 to 60 years in federal Indian policy. And it's now open season, like just like Roe v. Wade, I'm, I've talked to a lot of women um, who were like, we thought that like this was untouchable. We thought that this would never be overturned in the United States. And so all of a sudden we're seeing, right, we're seeing a lot of things that we thought were untouchable being completely dismantled and destroyed. And I also see like the, the shooting on the 4th of July in Highland Park, Chicago, right, which is um, I read is like one of the five most affluent communities in Illinois, the entire state. And so it's like, even the people in gated communities, right? Even like people who come from like an upper middle class, not necessarily a ruling class, but like an upper middle class position are, are now open and subject to state terror, right? To the terror of US imperialism and capitalism and colonialism. And that this should be a pause for us to think about what are the things that we need to unify against because it literally is open season on everyone and that is what the last two to three weeks has represented to me and it's like so what are we going to do about it given that this is the the new reality i feel like we shifted into some sort of new reality in the last two weeks um i just talked for a really long time i'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I think I think what you said that I mean is everything like so so the SCOTUS decision um, uh, from what I have read from Native American um, scholars law professors is that their understanding of um, the nation to nation relationship was based on um, precedent and was the, the interpretation that Scotus spewed forth was actually in, is inaccurate and w it it's it's just I don't know how to say this they went against laws that had had been written and set in stone using an inaccurate understanding and um, interpretation of the laws so if they can essentially, the highest court in the land can essentially misunderstand and misconstrue decades of Indian law and Indian policy and create a ruling based on those um, misunderstandings and um, 
and misreadings of that law, it's like 1984 and the truth becomes lies and the lies become truth and nobody knows what's up and what's down. It's time really um, for us to take um, an example from our relatives in um, in the Lacandone rainforest and it's time to declare war on the United States. And we know like our tribal leaders and activists and mostly activists in the 1960s and 1970s were the ones who um, actually um, enabled the, or, or created the impetus to have the Indian Child Welfare Act actually codified and who brought attention to all of the, the um, issues in Indian country, it was the activists and the people on the streets who, the people on the ground who were able to create this liberation movement, this red power movement. Um, And they didn't do it by stopping and consulting with the tribal leaders. So one of the things that's different about, at least, and I'm, I'm only talking to the Southwest right now because this is where I am, but is sweep away the tribal leaders and give power to the people. I mean, the power always resides with the people, but it's the people who need to create this new plurinational um, state because we are the ones who it, it will serve. We are the ones who will, who will be able to create this, this society. Our leaders are not going to do it. Our leader, our tribal leaders are not going to do it. Our, um, state leaders are sure as hell not going to do it. Our national leaders are not going to do it. It's up to the people and it's time to take that power and it's time to, to, um, start using it. I mean, it's time to, to stand up and say, fuck you to SCOTUS and fuck you to the Death Star in Washington and Mordor. And like, we're the hobbits who've got the little ring and we're going to, you know, Shut down the fucking highways, right? Refuse to participate in this imperialist capitalist state. Just stop and start by becoming self-sufficient. Start by, you know, arming by, and I'm not saying everybody go out and buy guns, but like arming ourselves with the knowledge and the ability and the capabilities of taking care of our own people. And, you know, highways go through our, our lands. Not anymore. 25 bucks a pop. If you're a tourist or especially if you have Texas plates, that's a hundred dollars per person. You know, we want exercise some tribal sovereignty. Our, our leaders are not going to do it but we can do it. And it's time to to just sweep aside all of these so-called governments that were installed by this imperialist colonialist project and start with the people because, you know, that's the only thing that we can do. That's the only way we're going to save the earth. And we have the power. We have the authority given to us by mother earth. Um, We just need to get it done. Yes, Elena. And I think like our tribal leaders, I don't think they have even begun to envision what our nationhood and sovereignty would look like without the U.S., right? We were here before the U.S., we'll be here after the U.S., but I don't think they've even begun to fathom that that is a possibility in our lifetime. And it very much is, clearly is, right? Um, I think it's hard for them to do so because it would force them to reckon with the fact that their power was never real or recognized to begin with. And I think that um, when we, as the people, approach them with solutions and ideas and dreams and visions of what we can be, that's when they say we're infringing on their sovereignty. But what they really mean is we're hurting their ego because they don't have that sovereignty to begin with. And it's becoming even less. And I think that is truly their worst fear. And it's my worst fear that when the US becomes so unstable or when the US 
straight up says, fuck you, you're done, you're terminated. My fear is that tribal leaders will lay down and die and tell us to to do the same. It's because like, most of them are men and they have no imagination or like heart or courage. <laughs> and I actually lay down and die was the exact words that were going through my mind when you started that sentence, Jen. I was like, they're just going to lay down and die. Yeah. Like, and we cannot allow that. They, they can do whatever they want, but like there are, I know like off the top of my head, like six young, like smart, educated Pueblo women who could literally design and install a new fucking government like now. And I'm not even joking. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm not like, (laughs) there are alternatives here. There are ideas, there's methods, there's strategies, there's frameworks, there's plans already here. And And there's some badass Pueblo women who could go into the tribal council headquarters right now and say, you're out. Just get the fuck out. And and they would be scared because they've always been scared of us. That shit should, I mean, Dene Sani for justice and Navajo Nation context, you're hearing it here, y'all. Please do that. Do that for the Navajo Nation too. Just get those motherfuckers out of there. All of these like dumb men. like Bowing and, and scraping and kissing the asses of the white colonizers from- <laughs> Enough. You know, from, yeah. Stop. Like, people are scared because there is real violence. Like, women get killed and beat and raped, and people are afraid of those very legitimate and real consequences. Women who do defy get made examples of, and, um, like, that is real. I don't blame anyone for not wanting to face those truly horrific consequences. But the stakes are life and death, not just of our tribes, not just of us as individuals, of life itself, of the whole entire planet. Um, That's just where we're at. And I wish it wasn't the case. And a phrase that comes to my head a lot lately is don't shoot the messenger, right? Don't shoot the messengers who are just telling you what's happening because it's not their fault we're in this position. Like... (laughs) Yeah, and, I, and and you know we 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 know so wow we got off on this detour. We know that sexual violence and gendered violence is is used as as um, a war tactic, and so there is fear. And honestly, it's the women who have the most to lose by actually standing up and fighting. And yet we're also the ones that are already under that boot heel. Of oh, yeah. the federal government. So we know the men aren't going to stand up for us because right now they're rolling over and kicking their legs up in the air while our bodily sovereignty and bodily autonomy have, have been have been taken away from us. So might as well just take it a step further and, you know, like it's time for the women to to lead the revolution. And, and we are. It, it already and happened. We are. And we are. And Catch up. <clears throat> or, you know, go go out into the cornfields and start growing corn. Let us run the shit. Or just get out of the way. I mean, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is a declaration of war on women, on feminism, um, on land back, right? I mean, that's I we should read it for what it is. And it's I was just I had this like epiphany <laughs> as you two are just talking. That like, remember in January of 2021, was it 2021 or 2020, when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police stormed Unistoten, right? The historic uh, refusal of the um, the Wet'suwet'en clans, uh, which has been led by women, um, Native women leaders of the Wet'suwet'en, to cede that land for oil and gas development, partic- especially, um, specifically a pipeline going through their lands. And you know how Canada has this whole like bullshit, like truth and reconciliation thing that it's gone through over the last 20 years. I think 2006 was the implementation of the official truth and reconciliation policy, which is related, of course, to boarding residential schools um, in Canada. And when the RCMP stormed Unistoten, like I forgot who it was, but the matriarchs of that struggle, they just declared officially reconciliation is dead. Reconciliation is dead. Like you have declared war on us. 
like fuck your reconciliation. And I would probably encourage people in this historic moment in the United States, I feel like we have not had our reconciliation is dead moment because I still hear people talking about it, like healing and reconciling with the US, you know, the selection of Deb Holland to the head of the Department of the Interior, um, kind of like the larger conversation around reparations and decolonization. We've, we, we are in a moment, I would say, post-2020, kind of like when Biden took power of this kind of like, we're in like reconciling with Native people. You know, in this moment, we're going to include you more in the halls of power. We're going to recognize like the special status of Native women. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you. What has happened in the last 10 days in this country? I'm going to tell you right now, reconcili reconciliation is dead. This is our reconciliation is dead moment. And I would really encourage people to like really internalize what that means in the United States, because everything that is happening is a total declaration of war on the very fabric of who we are as Native people. And as we've always said, right, Native women are the backbone of our nations and our women are under attack. Our children are under attack through this possible overturning of ICWA and our nations are under attack through these two decisions, the revision of the McGirt decision of 2020, the SCOTUS decisions, and then the, um, what is it called? The, the Bracken versus Holland case re um, that relates to ICWA. And I just, you know, like, it's okay to just like call it. We should just call it. And then we should just like reorganize in our minds to face this new reality. And, you know, it's like what medicine people say in the Navajo context. They're like, when your enemy is at the door, you don't lie down and die. Like what y'all were saying, the literal phrase, you don't lie down, you fight. <laughs> and right now, like, it's like we're at the beginning again of a new era. And right now we have to fight. And I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about reminding ourselves and remembering who we are as indigenous people, remembering that we're nations, remembering that there is incredible power in our women. There is such undeniable power in our ways, in our medicines and in our prayers and how we, how we exist on this land. And that is what has gotten us through the last fucking 550 years of this shitty genocidal colonial imperial project. And it will also be the basis of our survival right now through whatever is happening and the basis of the new world that we want to dream into existence and that we want to create. And we need to have the courage, and I want people to remember, especially our Indigenous relatives, to remember right now that we have power and we need to fucking wield it <laughs> in the most positive way possible because, like, shit is bad. I'm tired of, like, this genuflection to the U.S. I'm tired of this, like, oh, let's heal. Fuck you. This isn't, this isn't a moment for healing. You came for us moment for healing this is a moment that you know we have to declare war and war like you said dr mel war does not necessarily mean guns it does not necessarily mean um going to war this is a war of defense and this is this is where we stand up and just hold out our hands and say that that's it that's enough we are not going to take it anymore and you come for us we come for you but it's it's too much there's it's just too much right now you every time you turn around the autonomy we have over our bodies as women has been taken away from us and and that's bad enough but when you start fucking with the children then you're fucking with the future right and the idea that one native child would be fetishized and exoticized by some upper middle class white family just because it's the cool thing to do just makes me want to punch someone. And that's what happened in the 60s and 70s. And that's why ICWA was written, was to prevent this, this, um, you know, this termination of identity of native kids by having them raised by colonizers and fetishized and um, displayed as, as literally a conquest. 
And that's what was happening. Um, so, yeah, I'm declaring war on the United States. And it's like, it's not a war we even started, right? Like you said, it is a defensive war. They have forced our hand. We are peaceful people. And I do take pride in that. Pueblo people are peaceful people, but we're not docile. And we do have a revolutionary history. And when our hand is forced, we do resist. And we can resist. And I know people know that. And another thing, yeah, exactly. And another thing too is like, when people, I think a common thing I hear is like, people have this attitude like, oh, nothing's ever going to change. That's always how it's been. And I think that's what needs to be challenged the most. This is not always how it's been. Even just 40, 50 years ago, we were in a completely different place. And this is not how it always will be. There are possibilities, there are solutions. And it's like, I don't even always think it's that people are explicitly siding with the United States or are explicitly accepting the terms of our colonization. It's just that they are disempowered. And, and that is sad. Like, I want to empower our people. I want them to believe in alternative futures. I want them to believe in themselves and I want them to believe in each other. And I do believe in my people. Even if I get hate, you know, everything I do, everything we do is for the people that hate us the most as much as the people that support us the most. Because we can't pick and choose who we help or who we care for. And that's just a fundamental, like, philosophy, at least as Pueblo people, and I know most Native people. We can't choose, you know, we, we can't pick and choose. But also, like, going back to empowerment, like, I think... What empowers me is seeing what's possible. I want to share with my people what is happening in the rest of the world. I want them to see how we are connected politically and culturally and even spiritually in many cases. Like, I remember I didn't get a chance. I haven't had a chance to talk about this publicly, but I've been wanting to share it. Um, when I was in Venezuela, uh, I was given a book of all the different tribes there, and there was a tribe who was dressed so similarly to how we do. And um, I had just told the friend I was talking to, like, we actually have words in our language for the Amazon rainforest and it's a holy place to us. And she was like, really? And when I saw the photo of that man um, who looked so like us, she said, that man is from the Amazon. And like, she was, and that's when she was like amazed, like, and like believed and like really saw and like we, just felt that there was so much more for us. It's it's more than us being in solidarity with like the Bolivarian revolution. It's it's older than that even, right? <laughs> like it's very indigenous, actually. Yes. It's hemispheric. Like, it is. Truly. I truly. I had the same same experience in um Guatemala recently and and in the Amazon. Um, but I was in, in Guatemala and I was looking around at all of the people and all I could think of was they're all Pueblo. They, they look just like Pueblo people. And then I thought, well, maybe we look like the Maya, but yeah, it, it goes, it goes so deep. And like, I know people know that. Right. I, I know that we do retain that kind of knowledge about our migration and about our relationships to people in the South. And although I believe we as Native people, especially in the in, the, in South America, need to move beyond conceptualizing our identity as being only a cultural identity or only based or, or moving past the idea that, uh, you know, we're a racial identity. And I do think we need to build up ourselves as reminding ourselves that we are nations and we indigenous is a political status. I also think that again, our relatives in the global South are a perfect example of how they do that, but also retain their cultural connections and also use those cultural connections to build solidarity, to make those linkages and to think about how we are literally relatives. And I think there's a way to do that. And I think once we do that here, that is truly going to bring about 
a new world that's truly going to usher in this new era of prosperity because that's what I believe we're coming to. And I know there's stories about what happens when we transition into a new world. And I know that, that those stories include information about what the role of women will be. Yeah, I feel like the history of the of like kinship and that connection that predates the advent of modernity or like left politics, which, you know, we, um, we very much espouse in the Red Nation, but we are indigenous people, you know, at the end of the day. And I think it's those histories. That's what, when I think about like what you were saying, Jen, about our, our people feel really disempowered, like powerless and how I just genuinely from the bottom of my heart, I want our people to feel empowered. I want us to remember where our power comes from. And it comes from that. It comes from that. It comes from the connections we never lost and we never let go of that predate colonialism, that predate the advent of modernity, that predate conquest touching our lands. And like to really believe, to believe in the power of that and the fact that it's still there and it's just waiting, it's waiting for us to pick that back up, right? And that is something that is happening right now. I too believe in left internationalism as a really useful tool for how we implement those indigenous values, kind of like the Buen Vivir Pachamama model, how we implement that into the frameworks of peaceful cooperation and coexistence between nations, supporting each other so that we may ensure our mutual survival. That's essentially what plurinationalism describes. So I believe that these are two things that we can be actively advancing, both as like movements um, that represent a certain type and kind of conception of indigenous nationhood, but that our indigenous nations here can actually be practicing in a real way that kind of matches what indigenous movements and nations um, that are very diverse are doing in the global South all over, especially Latin America. And that this is this is our strength and we have that power and we it, it didn't go away. We just have to activate it, right? And we just have to really believe in it because that's, that's how we're going to survive. And to me, that is not, you know, that's not like, that's not, that's not like a hopeless, we're not facing like a hopeless kind of scenario. There's, to me, there's like real tangible material hope in that because we've never lost it. And it's literally just there. It's there for us to take up right now. And that's a beautiful, powerful thing that gives me a, a sincere sense of hope. And, you know, I'm reminded of um, our comrade Demetrius. He recently went to Montana, um, Southern Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne. I forgot where he was, but Northern Cheyenne, Lame Deer Territory. And he was talking to a medicine person up there. And this medicine person works with a lot of young people in their community. And this medicine person was telling D like, you know, you know, it's the qu a question I get all the time from youth. Like I'm like talking like teenagers, middle schoolers, because they're always seeing online, like on social media, people talking about how this is the end of the world and it's like the apocalypse. And they're like, is this the end of the world? You know, they're asking this medicine man this. And I think what I, I, you know, the medicine man had his own answer, but to me that just indicates that, you know, this isn't the end of the world. <laughs> This is a moment for transition and this is a time for us to remember who we are and that our strength comes from who we are as indigenous people and that we can fight, we can fight to protect that and that that will be the basis of a future. And so instead of thinking about it as apocalyptic or as the end of the world, we think about it from a completely different set, like a different framework and a set of values that is profoundly hopeful because it's real and that we've done this many times in the past, but that we've never lost touch with who we are. And like, it's primarily our women, women and medicine people who remind us and lead us in terms of, of remembering who we are. And that's going to be our future. As Nick says, our history <laughs> is the future, but it, it really is true. Um, and not to lay down and die. <laughs> in this moment, right? And not to see it as like, oh God, well, this is too much for us to deal with. So we might as well just give up. I see a lot of people giving up. I understand that response, but I'm telling you to not do that. Don't give up. This is not the end of the world. Indigenous people will be here seven generations from now. 
still speaking our language and still strong as nations. Believe that in your heart because we that's what we need to make it through this. And we carry that with us. Pueblo people carry that with us because of the Pueblo revolt and because of what was what was achieved with the Pueblo Revolt and, and with Pope's leadership and the coming together of, of different communities to fight a common enemy. And um, if our ancestors had given up and accepted Spanish rule and the church and slavery and everything that came with colonization, we wouldn't be here now. Um, and to them, I'm sure it must have looked like the end of the world because being, being prohibited from, from practicing, you know, traditional spirituality and life ways was the end of the world because there, there was no, no other way for our ancestors to survive, but to, you know, pray and sing and dance and do what, what we had done for, for, um, millennia. So it must have looked like the end of the world for them too. Children were being taken away. Um, women were being enslaved. Women were being raped and um, and in, and enslaved and sold into slavery and removed from communities. And um, all of our, our medicine people were under attack. The kivas were destroyed. Um, sacred objects were destroyed and stolen. That must have looked like an apocalypse, but they didn't lay down. They didn't lay down and die. And that's what we carry with us is, is that spirit. And, and the, you know, the spirit of Pope is now in the women and the young people. And that's, that's who we're going to fight this next revolt. And you can hear them talking about it. Um, and it, it just, it makes me happy to hear that because we know that they're they're still fighting that that spirit is still there and we still have the same common enemy all of us across turtle island and we know who that is and we know who's who's leading the charge to defend us is comrade buffalo i have to talk about comrade buffalo because this is in the news all the time, and every time it comes up, it makes me laugh. Um, three dumb white people in Yellowstone tried to pet Comrade Buffalo. And Comrade Buffalo had had enough and tossed them all. They all ended up getting gored. And like the stupidity of some people is beyond me. Um, you have a large creature that weighs a ton that can run 35 miles an hour and has really sharp horns and hooves. And you still think it's okay to go and try to pet it. So that's the number one stupidity. Then you see all of these things on YouTube and on the news of people getting gored and having to go to the hospital, and you still go try to pet the buffalo. Comrade Buffalo is taking down settlers one at a time. So here's a shout out to Comrade Buffalo. It's also just like very, like such a, such a silly and accurate metaphor, right? It's like white people have such an inflated sense of like ego and power and entitlement that they truly believe they can get away with and like come away unharmed approaching an animal like that, like approaching a being that is that powerful. And I think it's just like the ultimate, like it really, really sums up like the history of colonization, right? You, you, you touch the buffalo, you get the horn. And the story, you like touch that. the <laughs> buffalo, you get the, that's the title of this episode. You touch the buffalo, you get the horns. I'm writing it down. That I'm always waiting best. for that moment in our recordings <laughs> where like the, the title emerges organically. The oh, mic drop that title. That is the best. We should get t-shirts with the new Red Nation logo and on the back says, you touch the buffalo, buffalo you get the you horns. Get the horns. <laughs> this is going to like spark some new like 
like incel revolution, but it's going to be like an interspecies <laughs> one, right? So instead of it's like um, white men feeling like they're victimized by women rejecting them, it's going to be like white settlers being victimized by the rejection of the bison. <laughs> It's gonna be like I don't know what the name of that would be because the alt right emerged out of that, but okay. But like, also there already is like a very alt right, like um, you know, camping outdoorsman kind of like hippie movement that is like you're right, very, like truly like very much already against like being denied access to public land. Oh, that's and, right. Like, sacred sites, like they are. It's like very anti Indian, very anti Indian. Yes. Like they're, they really truly believe they're being stomped on because they can't go camping in sacred sites because they can't go desecrate our sacred sites because they can't like do it, have their like bullshit raves on our, in our mountains. Like they really, really believe that like their, their liberty is being trampled upon. And so it's just, yeah, it's like a new age version of, of all of this. And like, of course the forest service and like, the you know Department of Interior in many ways actually assists this, and they actually cite on many occasions like the the decisions and the policies of these entities to like defend themselves. It's it's really ridiculous. Yeah, wasn't there like a rainbow gathering or something that was supposed to happen recently? Were they denied access or like I forgot oh, what that story was? They're never denied access, even when they are, they still do it. Yeah, so because they can't legally be denied access because they're not an organization. If they were, if they were an organization, they would have to apply for a permit. But they are not um, actually an organization. So, like um, Comrade Chigmanitu was actually telling me, and this makes so much sense that QAnon, right? QAnon has actually been growing its ranks in that like new agey hippie group, and that makes total sense because they're like eco fash right? Like they're like the, the environmental incels, <laughs> essentially. Um, who are just like, oh my God, we deserve access to all land. And like, this buffalo is violating my human rights, you know, and things like that. Um, and so it makes total sense that QAnon is very appealing to that group of folks. Because I mean, you, I, I feel shocked sometimes when I find out um, that there are like environmentalists who are total QAnon hacks, right? Um, but this helps to help us make the connection behind why, why that happens politically um, and why fascism in general is just gaining a lot of ground. And like Comrade Buffalo Buffalo has a very long, long memory. And Comrade Buffalo remembers how their relatives were slaughtered by colonizers. Right. And like Philip Deloria has been telling us about this for like decades now, right? And even before that, like, he maps this history of how the hippie movement, how the rainbow movement has always been a product of colonialism, has always been about rebranding a white identity, um, has been about like, you know, according to Patrick Wolf, the highest stage of colonialism, becoming the new native, asserting their right to the land and to the environment. Like this comes from the transcendentalist, like this, ha- its roots go so deep, right? And it, this is just the latest manifestation of it. And it's really not surprising when there's like a very clearly documented like history. Yeah, and there's the, I was going to say that there, the, and it, it makes perfect sense because the early communes, um, the ones that all of the disenchanted um, youth of the 60s, they were in Taos. And white buffalo was the first biggest of the communes, and and uh, they yeah white buffalo it's still there. Ew! They, they called themselves white buffalo. They this did. reminds myself of that Yoda ass white woman who was claiming she's white buffalo calf woman. This is like a legend <laughs> in the Red Nation. Anyway, yes, I. Well, they they started this commune white, and they were they were all you know they were upper middle class white college students who decided they were going to go in, you know, rebellion against their parents. Um, and they ended up in Taos and they created this commune and, you know, their idea was to be self-sufficient off the grid, um, all of this. And they started it in the summer and by the winter, they were all freezing to death because they had no wood and people from Taos Pueblo took pity on them and, took them firewood and taught them how to stay warm. And that, that 
you know, epitomizes right there this whole idea of white privilege living off of and then ultimately cannibalizing um, Native people, Native culture. Well, then go bison. Go the bison brigade at the bison brigade of Antifa. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like hell yes. Let's go bison. <laughs> so let's go bison. <laughs> Jen. Jen. Jen is back. Iconic Jenisms. Let's go, Bice. <laughs> the oh, oh, so should that be the title of the show? Let's go, Bison, or should it be "You Touch the Buffalo, You Get the Horns"? It's hard, I like and they should both the be buffalo. t-shirts. I like "You Touch the Buffalo, You Get the Horns." Oh my God, Jen, I'm dead. <laughs> <sighs> I have um I have more I want to say but I feel like we kind of passed that moment and maybe we should wrap up there uh maybe I can bring this up in two episodes coming up um I do think we should end quickly just a little quick and no I think we should still do I'm glad you're dead oh um, I completely forgot wow who kicked the bucket in the past two days who thank you real big pieces of shit <laughs> <laughs> all right let me open up sorry you're hearing my mouse clicks sorry cena i know you hate it so uh the former mexican president luis echevarria uh passed away this week glad you're dead because echevarria when they were i think the secretary of interior no when they were president but also part of the cabinet of the mexican government um in the 1970s oversaw and there's pretty heavy proof that they ordered the execution of um, those student movements and those students. If people remember the historic, right, assassination um, and massacre of the student uprisings, the pro-democracy student uprisings of 1968 and 1971 specifically. Uh, and that Luis Echevarria was heavily implicated um, in, in those, the repression um, of the Mexican government at that time. And as our, I hope Mayra is okay with me reading. Mayra is from Mexico. And she said this, of Echevarria, quote, He was responsible for the massacres of Tlatelolco, 1968, and the Jalconazo, 1971. He was a genocidal leader of the Institutional Revolutionary Party um, and has now left the world with total impunity. He's a total sociopath. He would confuse and deceive political factions, supporting Cuba's revolution and Chile's Allende presidency, even supporting the United Nations resolution to equate Zionism to apartheid, while murderously and violently repressing student mobilizations and financing both social programs and funds, and training paramilitary squads of young impoverished mestizo, Afro-descendants, and indigenous men to go after other impoverished working class and student organizations. And... There was end quote, and there's a lot written about how he was um, in public, very like a vocal supporter, even of like left and like socialist projects, like right equating Zionism to apartheid. But in fact, what he was doing internally in Mexico um, was assassinating <laughs> and like creating the conditions for the repression and the disappearing of political dissidents in Mexico. Um, and even though there were several calls, there were cases, um, there were movements to try to bring him to justice for essentially what are war crimes in Mexico. He never faced any type of accountability for his role in that. And he died at a hundred years old. I don't know, like a couple of days ago with, as you know, our comrade Maida said, um, total impunity. So glad you're dead. Hope you're in hell. Um, Luis Echevarria for, for the role that you played in the right wing turn and the dictatorships <laughs> in America um, in the 1970s. So, and for lying Glad to people dead. about who you really were. Glad you're dead. Hope you're burning. Right. Rest in peace, sack of shit. <laughs> another, another person that was glad is dead. Enzo Abe. I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. 
there's a lot of liberals mourning him like they knew who the fuck he was for some reason sorry for cussing you can edit that scene <laughs> We dropped so many f bombs. Sorry, guys. We're just really like mad. <laughs> so Shinzo Abe, he was um, longest sitting prime minister of Japan. He's the grandson of the notorious war criminal uh, Nobusuke Kishi. Um, you know, during World War II, he's responsible for um, the, the the imperial domination of like essentially like um, like Eastern and Southeast Asia during that time. Um, he was uh, notorious for facilitating the sex trafficking of um, thousands of Korean and Chinese women who are known more broadly as the comfort women, right? Um, well, his grandson, Shinzo Abe, he, um, he openly praised his grandfather and the fascist history of Imperial Japan. Um, he was known for regularly going to a shrine dedicated to his grandfather even though his grandfather was actually tried as a war criminal. And um, he uh, straight up refused to pay reparations to the families of the so-called comfort women. Um, He is, um, as our comrade um, Kara from Affirm Hawaii said, um, his name is a dirty word to third world feminists because of the way he facilitated, or not facilitated, well, indirectly facilitated and um, continued to um, deny justice to the many Asian women who were trafficked and prostituted under the regime of his grandfather. So rest in peace. Um, I also just love the way he was taken out. I've seen the handcrafted thingamabob that one righteous Japanese citizen used to just blast that full, like, let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Glad you're dead. Um, and glad you're not dead, but that you're leaving power. Boris Johnson just hates you, hate your hair. Don't know why you can't afford a comb. Um, imperialist colonizer just hate you. Glad you're stepping down. Glad all your partying during the queen's birthday or whatever the fuck that was got you in such trouble that you decided you needed to step down. Actually, I hate all y'all over there in England. You suck. Don't like the queen. Don't like any of those people. Like colonizers, 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 imperialists, imperialists, imperialists. You all can just go to hell. Didn't the queen's jubilee, which also happened recently, what didn't that start during the imperial period of Great Britain? I think it oh, did. Yeah. And then she, yeah. she like traveled through the Commonwealth or whatever. Um, yes, the Commonwealth. Being like, I am the queen. I am the queen. Like, fuck that. Um, are you seeing that video going around of her visiting like a res? Or I mean, it's not technically a res as we know it, but she's visiting a native community in Canada. And there's just like these res kids running around and she's like, <laughs> like looks like she's about to like kill over. Like, just <laughs> kids. <laughs> She's just done in by some rowdy res kids. Like, who isn't done in by rowdy res kids? Holy crap. That's a that's a beast to reckon with. Let's go, res kids. Um, wow. I, we haven't done that in a long time. Those were excellent. Um, excellent breakdowns. I agree with both of those. Glad you're dead. Glad you're out of power. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to maybe finish off with a few things I think I would encourage folks to be really paying attention to coming up in terms of world affairs affecting indigenous people and the things we're talking about here. Um, The first is again, the Supreme court decision that is, I don't know when they're going to hand it down. Is there session over like the next session it's Brock Brocken Brockeen versus Holland. It's the one where ICWA is up on the chopping block. Um, If ICWA is overturned um, the Indian child welfare act, then that would essentially mean kind of like another kind of reconciliation is dead moment because there's this big report about boarding schools, right? That Deb Holland speared as the DOI head um, that came out in May. Jen and Nick did a two-part podcast episode, breaking that down. Very excellent. I encourage you to listen to that. But um, if ICWA is overturned, then basically that's like a fuck this healing reconciliation moment around the the legacy of boarding schools because it's essentially still about the theft of indigenous children as a genocidal tactic, um, according to the United Nations. And so I feel like that would really put like, that's like the 
the nail in the coffin, the final nail in the coffin of reconciliation if it was overturned. I think the recent Colombian election, the presidential election, another excellent podcast episode that Nick and Jen did with David Adler came out, I think, on the 21st of last month, June, um, uh, uh, from the Progressive International, like this historic um, addition to the rise of progressive and left-wing governments for the new pink tide in Latin America, Colombia being like one of the strongholds of U.S. imperial um, kind of power and maneuvering in Latin America, um, and kind of watching what's going on internally. There's a lot of struggles. There's obviously like a lot of paramilitary violence that needs to be um, taken care of in order for what was it like um, David Adler was saying, you can have government power, but you need people power. And like popular power is a completely different thing. And so they're struggling with that right now, as we are, I think, in the United States. Um, And then also on October 2nd, um, Lula da Silva, a really important, like very important election happening in Brazil. He's trying to defeat Bolsonaro, of course, the the Trump fash um, of of the Brazilian era of of neo-fascism. Um, Lula da Silva declared in May, uh, I think it was on May 7th, so just a couple of months ago, that he was running for president again. And so that election will be on October 2nd. Pay attention, because that is a huge deal. If Lula wins that election, that will be a huge deal um, in terms of everything that we've talked about today. So those are just my predictions, my, my, my top three things <laughs> for people to watch out for. Well, this was a great round table. <laughs> Dang, just lots of F-bombs, lots of like burn it down, lots of declarations of war. That was excellent, an excellent <laughs> turn in this episode. Uh, I think all, I mean, I apologize if people are offended by the language, but also it's like I, you know, like when you're having to just engage in a self-defense against a total declaration of war, like why not just be honest, you know, and real about what's going on? Um, so you, I'm pretty sure people know they can always find that here <laughs> in Red Power it's Hour. It's really high to get hung up on, on on getting offended by language at this point, like truly, truly. I don't mean that in like a, like a whack-ass, like Ben Sharpeo way. I just mean like, we're going to die here if we don't do something. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the least of our worries. Um, and as we say, <laughs> when we're dealing with like conflict resolution and pretty much anything pertaining to leadership or like the strategic direction of the Red Nation in um, our Principles of Unity, which I reread recently, the, the last kind of like clause of each section was listen to Indigenous women. <laughs> it's like literally the refrain throughout the entire organization. So I encourage you to listen to Indigenous women, um, whether or not they're dropping the F-bomb or talking about burning things down. Because um, Indigenous women are leading our movements and, you know, have no know what to do. I think Indigenous women know what to do. And it's just our responsibility to follow their lead and to, to provide that support. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for Red Power Hour. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. I don't know what we'll be talking about. Everything's probably going to fucking change <laughs> the next two weeks. So we'll see. Maybe we're trashing the new it's not alien, the predator movie, or like, maybe we're talking about more news. Maybe we have to talk about the ICWA Supreme court case. I don't know, but have a good week. It's Sunday. Yeah. Have a good week comrades.